Right. Hi, I'm Sanjana from For Real Now in the Circular Closet. Today I'm here with Mr. Yasir Hashmi. He's an eight-figure um, businessman and has many, he has advice that he wants to give on entrepreneurship. So first, let's talk about your book. Do you want to say a few words about it before we get started? Yeah, for sure, definitely. So basically, and thanks for having me on the show, Sanjana. So yeah. I launched the book basically last to last week and this book is basically based on entrepreneurship and personal development and according to me it's it's I for me I mean it's like the best business and personal development book which I have ever read because the thing is you know I mean most of the books which I read I like you read 200 pages and you just learn all the things which which were there in 200 pages you could have just learned those things in one page and it yeah. was just time waste and it was just like a blog which has been copy pasted in the form of so many stories so I really hate basically you know books which are like this and a lot of books are like this and especially I see you know the credibility or asset of that person who has written the book if that person is a full-time author whose only work is writing books throughout his life then of course you know i might not get as much value as i could get in a business book written by someone who has really made it in business or who has grown a business to a certain level and duplicated that because you i mean it's like the end result does not determine if you choose if you took the right decision or if you choose the right process because you could be lucky okay and the other thing is is if you can duplicate the same thing then it's something you know then it's not look then it's more about skill that it that you are a really valuable person you are a really credible person and you have done things and you have duplicated it so that's the thing but a lot of time people are like you know focusing on anomalies it's like people want people i mean people have basically you know, different narratives for starting a startup or a business or being an entrepreneur that they can create a company like facebook or apple basically you know overnight or basically over a few years but that's anomaly okay and there are only few companies like that there are only four five four five companies are there in the world that are trillion dollar okay. companies so that's how it is so you know for my book it's launched recently the ebook version is available globally anyone basically i'll definitely recommend anyone basically who is interested or opposed to entrepreneurship to go on our website yasirhashmi.com which you can find in the description we'll put in the description and basically you know you can see the book and there is a sample as well and i guarantee you will find great value from this book if you want then okay. i'm happy to refund so basically it's a great book and the other thing is this the, the way this book is written is in the form of data points it has more than like four five hundred paragraphs of insights which i have learned over my business career it's like normally every almost every day i learn something i write in my notes so those things are written in the form of paragraph in those in, in that book it's not like story i was born here or doing this so it, it, it's not like this okay so it's a bit different it's more straightforward so okay. it has data points which any any reader can apply according to the context of their life so yeah I, okay I, great definitely yeah. yeah so i wanted to just like start from chapter one and talk to you about sure. a couple things that i learned and a couple things i want to clarify sure so in the beginning, you discussed the importance of being decisive. So what if sometimes you don't know if a decision is correct for your business or as an individual when you're investing, right? So what if you are investing too much and making too many decisions? How do you know what's yeah. the right amount to make? Yeah, so it's like, so it's like the thing about a venture capital fund is like, you know, when you raise a venture capital fund, you are first raising that fund from a LP that's a limited partner okay and the thing about a limited partner is when you go to the limited partner that you are raising a fund the limited partner asks what's the investment thesis of your fund is it an early stage fund or what kind of fund is it and how what's the check size which you're investing what's the industries in which you're investing what's the geography you are investing in okay and what's the valuation at which you are investing in so they ask all these questions because the thing is see as an lp let's say if i'm an lp so i have a portfolio and every portfolio has three types of investments one is a lower risk investment then you have medium risk investment then you have high risk investment that's how you basically allocate your portfolio and so the high in terms of the high risk investment of a LP a limited partner the, they have alternative investments and in terms of alternative investments there are two major vehicle or asset class for alternative investments one is a venture capital fund another one is a private equity fund and the thing about a venture capital fund is a venture capital fund 
is a fund that's investing in new ventures and startups. So okay, a private equity fund is a company that's acquiring those startups when they mature and then the private equity firm basically, you know, fix the problems which that business is facing, keep that business for several years, 10, 20 years, then sell it to another company, another private equity fund or another bigger company, another strategic partner. So that's how it works. So that's our venture capital fund. And from the venture capital fund, we tell everything to the LP and then basically we start investing. We tell them that every investor, every VC fund has a 10 to 14 years of timeline. Okay. It's like we have our only timeline of 10 to 14 years. We have to invest all that money. We have to basically, you know, get those, get those investors, investments to get harvested. And then we have to sell that as well in this 10 years period. There's some three to four years extension because it takes time for a company to mature and start investing. So in the first four years of our investor, basically, you know, basically, you know, investment fund journey, in the first four years, that's called the investment period where you make the investments. So it depends on the f amount of the fund. So let's say if you have a $15 million fund, so you are getting $3 million in management fee. The managing partner, me and my partner, we are getting the management fee and also the fund admin, the law firm to do all the work. Okay, so that's the... That's the basically management fee. It's two percent per annum for ten years. It's twenty percent of the fund total amount, and then basically you know we invest in we invest from the check size which we decide, which is like two fifty k to five hundred k dollars. So according to that, we invest in companies. So we divide those investments according to the amount that's left, and according to that, we de decide that how many investments per month we have to do. So for us, it's one investment per month. So over 48 months, we have to invest in one company per month. But it's like, you know, currently no one is investing. It's very yeah. basically slow time in the market because of recession. And it's like valuations are still going down. But still, people are in a lot of fear. LPs are not investing in funds. That's the biggest problem with VC funds. That VC funds that are basically, you know, raising now, they are unable to raise. They are having a hard time raising because it's the worst time in the history of America to raise money. At the same time, it's the best time it's a it's it's a best time from the perspective of liquidity in the market there has been highest liquidity in the u.s market than it has ever been in the history of america so that's the best thing basically and basically you know about this current time but of course you know the other thing is this we are optimistic about the future because you know the if you will research basically over the past hundred years or how the markets were you will learn one thing that you know the best financial year of any decade is the year just after recession year so next year is going to be the best economic year uh basically in the history of america because you know it's just after the year of recession because you know the thing is the recession was really going to come in 2020 because of covid but it was yeah. basically you know government produced you know basically you know created fake money you know which is printed trillions of dollars which is distributed in the economy and it yeah. was like now now it's like now it is created a lot of problem a lot of inflation and it's like you know you have 2022 2021 2020 basically you know basically three so it's like for four years where this bubble has been there okay i mean so this situation yeah. the inflation delayed the recession i mean that's one of the reasons but it's like government tried to solve those problems which were being created so it's like see the thing about inflation is when the value of money reduces so it's just like let's say if there are three basically you know, let's say if there are three yeah. dollars yeah, okay i know yeah so it's like so it's when, when something extra comes to so the total increases in denominator but the numerator remains the same so it's like yeah. it's just like for the audience it's like inflation is like let's say if you have three dollars you know three basically three have dollars and let's say, you know, I have one point one and a half dollar. She has one and a half dollar. Okay, so the total is like one and a half dollar above three. You have one and a half dollar above three. So now you printed one another dollar. So now the total is four. So now you have two point five upon four. I have one point five upon four. So the value of my money reduced. So that's how inflation works. So when more money yeah. is printed, that's how my money, basically, the value of my money reduced. And when the money value of money is reduced, then you know people want to can keep their profits consistent. They increase basically, you know, their prices. That's how it happens. Yeah. And it's like the other thing is this, you know, like people are very happy that they're getting, you know, if they, if they, I mean, in a lot of countries, people basically give their money to the bank in the savings account in which they are getting four to five percent interest. They think they are getting four to five percent return, but the thing is, every year money's value basically is being reduced by inflation every three i mean three percent by three percent it's like you are only if you are getting return of six percent a year you are getting return of three percent because inflation is 
uh, basically you know setting off that rest rest of the three person so that's yeah. how things are so you have to be very you know deep thinker in order to understand how your money is working and how basically you know how much return you are getting that's why in a fund you don't you don't calculate return on investment you create you you calculate irr internal return rate because it's like there are a lot of factors to determine the return of a fund because the thing is it's like if you have a 15 million dollar fund it's not like you have all the money in the bank you only do capital calls for the amount of money which you are going to invest otherwise money is in the bank 3% of the value of the money is being destroyed every year so you don't okay. want to just keep have the money sitting in so that's how it works so your role in the company is like managing finances looking over economic trends so basically, I mean, it's not just one thing. It's a very diff different base. It, it's like a very complex structure in a venture capital fund. And a venture capital fund is not like one fund. It's like there are three entities in a single venture capital firm. It's mm -hmm. like you have a limited partnership, which is the partnership between me and my partner. That's mm -hmm. not a that's not a company. Okay, partnership is not a company. So one is okay. a limit. One is a limited partnership. Then you have a management company that manages the fund. The limited partnership is the comp basically you know is the entity that basically. So limited partner is the entity that manages the partnership. Okay, mm -hmm. basically, which gets the carried interest. Carried interest is a 20% of the fund profit. So that is distributed to the limited partners, the people that manage the fund according to the proportion. Okay, like, and the okay. other thing is basically, you know, the management company, which gets a 2% basically annual management fee, which has two directors, which is me and my partner, because we are the basically fund manager. Okay, and then it's the third thing, that's a fund where the money is there. So there are three bank accounts as well. There are three different bank accounts as well. And all of them has almost the same name because it's a Hashmi Ventures. So it's Hashmi Ventures. It will be called Hashmi Ventures. So it's like the other thing it says, in terms of, you know, basically my role, it's a very complex role because the thing is, a, f a venture capital firm, or, I mean, you know, managing capital is something which is a very high leverage job. High leverage job is like, what I mean by this is, you know, so it's like a leverage is something, it's just like a difference between input and output, duration between input and output, okay? So you can have a venture capital fund of $500 billion and you can just have four people manage the full fund because you can outsource mm -hmm. everything. People outsource everything. Like there's the fund admin back, back office stuff, you just outsource, you don't hire anyone. For the law firm, you just outsource, you don't have a lawyer, you need to hire a lawyer. You just have two people or three people or the number of partners in the fund that gets the compensation and you just have one admin or analyst who analyzes the deal. That's enough for at least a basically you know, $50 million fund or otherwise then you need to hire more analysts. So we just have an analyst and it's like, you know, for me, my main focus is to get basically you know, more and more deal flows and to determine if we should invest in a company or not according to a lot of factors because, you know, one of the factor basically is you know to have a company that has at least a revenue of five hundred thousand dollars to a million dollar because that tells product market fit so it means is so it's like when you grow a business your focus is on product market fit when you go, until the level of a million dollars in revenue it's about product market fit it means that what you are really creating is what the market really needs is there a demand for what you are creating otherwise it's just a waste of time so how do you if know if there's a demand for what you're creating we have revenue numbers never lie people lie numbers never lie so if there's a certain level of revenue people who have really grown business they know that there's a market to serve it's like yeah. you know when you have a revenue it tells there's a proof of concept what you're creating is what market needs and this is oh. something we basically you know which we can trust that you know people really need it because it's real numbers it's real bank account real audited state financial statements so it mm -hmm. tells okay so basically you know you have the basically you know one thing is cash flow which is the most important part because cash flowing business is the thing about cash flowing businesses is you know if they don't get further venture funding in the further rounds then still they can bootstrap and they grow on their own they don't need to you know basically keep on sucking venture capital or die without venture capital we don't want that business we want a business which is able to self-sustain if let's say if they don't get future funding so we are investing in it okay great we want a business that's cash flowing simple predictable yeah. a business that we can say that you know will exist over the next 50 years because you know the one of one very interesting way to think about things is in a long-term perspective because most of the time long term is the opposite of short term because you know what's right in long term is a lot of times wrong in short term 
I mean, a lot of cases, not every case, but at the same time, we have to, we, I mean, the thing about Venture Capital Fund is, you have to be answerable to your LPs, you have to show them the reports that, you know, what you are really doing, what's the return which you're getting, but at the same time, the people who invest in your fund are not stupid, these people have very high patience, these people are not like checking every day, what, you know, what's yeah. happening with my money, they're not like this, because the other thing is, is the people who are investing in a Venture Capital Fund, are not like baby funds. These people are basically running, basically, you know, they have assets of more than billions of dollars or $300 million, $500 million. So, I mean, these people have just a small allocation from their portfolio which they're writing. So that's how it is. Like I've been talking to different LPs and, you know, now in, in business and in, they see that's the thing about business and, you know, uh, managing a fund. I, was, I mean, you know, it's like in terms of a meeting, I did a 90 minutes meeting, two meetings, 45, 45 minutes a meeting. I closed the investor for $2 million and then another investor for $4 million. So it's like, yeah. you know, and, and if, if you compare it with business, it's like you do, you know, whole years of effort, then you are able to get near to it. So that's the basically, you know, basically difference between yeah. a fund and a business. You know, I mean, I like business, I love business, but the thing is, why will I want to work hard? Like, why should I work hard, right? I mean, okay. why will I not want to do something which is which has very high leverage, which is worth my time? Because the thing is, it's not about how hard you row, it's about which boat you row. It's not like you know yeah. you, how hard you are working. It's about in which vehicle which you are working. And the thing like I went switched. Right, right. I mean, the other thing is this, like, you know, the reason I switched into venture capital is because I know I can never be a billionaire through investment banking. So that's why I focus on basically, you know, venture capital because it's about asset management. It's just about next level, next level. Like currently my venture capital fund is about $15 million and I plan to launch a $50 million fund, then 150 mm -hmm. million, then 500 million. So in that way, it will keep on going on. And then I'll use my basically, you know, wealth in order to buy those companies. Currently my, my focus from my wealth management is on real estate because the thing is you also have to structure your wealth when you are, when yeah. you have enough. Okay, first thing to manage wealth, you need to have wealth. Okay. So it's like, you know, so you have to structure your focus from income to wealth management when 10% of your wealth growth is equal to your annual income. Like if you have a net worth of 10 million and if you have an annual income of a million dollars, then your focus should be on wealth management because you can easily get, if you will properly focus on your wealth, you can properly, you know, basically get more than 10% annual return on your wealth. So that's basically yeah. how you can basically you know, structure things. And venture capital is like very interesting and alternate private equity is also very interesting. And it's Actually, like, you know, before we move on. Sure. Um, so when you're investing and you yeah. see a company that, let's say, has like half a million dollars and another company that has a million dollars. But how do you know which one will grow the fastest apart from like their starting points? How do you know if one like, let's say one's on a downward slope, it's becoming like like less like you know in the stock market when a company has a less return yeah. and then how do you know that it's going to grow is there a certain factor that plays into that you yeah, see it's like one of the most important things especially i mean the thing about a stock market company that's very stable business okay that's yeah. why it's on the stock market and the thing about basically you know the future profitability is like to see the past data never lies i think the best thing about data is data gives you confidence and predictability about something what will happen so, mm -hmm. you know, first of all, you have to see what are the financial statements of that company for the past 10, 20 years, because that will help you determine, you know, what it will be in the next 20 years. Of course, there's yeah. a lot of variables. There's always a lot of variables. It's not just any one thing. There are a lot of variables and you need to mm -hmm. focus on the variables that gives the highest output. Like a variable in a, for a student could be like, a student could be like in a situation where a student is studying for 16 hours, sleeping eight hours, still not getting you know, 100% marks, still getting 80% yeah. marks. So this means there's a variable that's missing. A variable could be strategy. Okay, now that student is going, talking to all the toppers of his school, since the school was created, now that person is still getting 90% marks. Now that person is like, why, what's the reason I'm not getting full marks? Then it could be like, you know, he's not, he's working, he's studying for 18 hours, 16 hours, but he's not studying for 16 hours for the past, you know, two years or three years. That could be the reason. Or uh, so, or if if he if he has even done that, still he's not getting hundred percent marks, hundred percent marks. Then it's like you know, it's not right vehicle for him naturally. Like a lot of things that comes naturally. Like a lot of things I think in life are innate, are inborn. You can develop a lot of things in life. Like in your IQ, you can increase your IQ. You can increase your EQ. Now the other thing yeah. about basically you know the data is, 
See, it's like data. What happens in the past also help you to determine what will happen in the future. But at the same time, the, the, there are a lot of variables. The thing about variables is, you know, before the management was different, the, the types of decisions which management took was different. The you know technology which was available was different. They basically, you know, a lot of other things in the market were different. There was different things. The company might have got lucky in certain years. What were the different years for different things? Okay, and then you know, basically, we can use all those database in order to understand how the company's revenue will be in future. Like. One great example is for healthcare. You know, in America, it is the highest healthcare basically expenses yeah, yeah. in America, right? You know, one of the reason, especially in pharma, why is the reason? It's like when you are a scientist, you do research and development, you do clinical trials, you get FDA approval, different kinds of approval. Then yeah. you apply for patent. You you know, basically you know you spend money to get extensions on the patent. So let's say you got a patent. You know, default it's like twenty years. You have a you have a basically patent that expires in twenty years. And mm -hmm. you can extend it by you know, other twenty years, then it's forty years. So you are in a situation where you are, you know, basically, you know, basically, you know, you have a patent. You have no competition for the next forty years. So you can sell anything for whatever rate you want. People will die if you if they won't buy it. So they will buy at any cost. So that's the thing about the U.S. pharma. Like they charge so much. Like the same thing which can which they make in a dollar, they sell it for a thousand dollars. So that's basically, you know. That's how it is basically, you know, in the U.S. market. But there's a one interesting way. I think that's a it's a great solution which they can do, you know, and this will solve the whole four, four five trillion dollar industry problem. Like healthcare industry is like four five trillion industry in U.S. market alone. So one great way I think to solve this, you know, high prices problem is basically in pharma is like let's say if you are a company, okay, you created a, yeah. you did the invention. Of course, you did the invention, so of course you can make money, but you don't need to exploit that you are harming the society. People are unable to afford it. People are dying because of you. Okay, so one thing I think you know which people can do it. Companies can do is like let's say they created the you know they invented a product. Of course, they did the hard work. They did a clinical trial. They spent a lot of time doing research in order to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's like they created a basically medicine. Then what they do? They basically you know they charge whatever they want for the next five years, and after that. They let's say they are selling something for thousand dollars. They sell it for thousand dollar for five years, and after five years, basically they lease that patents to other companies. Okay, they are like, you can you know rent. We are renting this patent. You can basically lease it patent. You can create your own medicine for the next yeah. fifteen years, and you can sell whatever price. But I'll get. I should get ten percent of your profit. I should get ten percent mm -hmm. of the profit. Then those mm -hmm. companies, let's say, are selling for two hundred dollars. So of course, this has to also reduce their price from a thousand dollars. So if they're getting 10% for 20, 30 competitions, so overall it's almost the same thing. And they have a, they have now got distributors which are distributing their medicine. Their name is getting famous basically. And it's uh, like, of course, other companies' name is also getting famous, but at the same time, their formula is getting famous and they are making commissions over all those different people who are distributing because they can't go into every street of US, okay? But it's like these people, these small companies can do it because they got the patent lease now. So, so now they can use because because there's several distributors they would make more money than if right, they were just right. selling on a deeper level, right? And at the same time, they'll make more money, almost almost the same amount of money or more money. And then after yeah. 15 years, the patent will expire, and then they will be having you know major co normal competition. Because you know if you observe the chart of the revenue of these pharma companies, if they I was I was watching chart of one pharma company yesterday that has like 20 billion dollars in revenue. And just next year, when their revenue, basically their patent got expired, their revenue declined by 75%, just because yeah. they got competition who was selling at cheaper rates. Mm. So how amazing is that? So, and that's one of the things. And the other thing I was thinking is basically, you know, I was planning about starting a teledoc business in America. Okay, basically telemedicine platform basically in America because, you know, I mean, US basically, I mean, you know, US doctor shares a lot of money. Okay, of course, that's according yeah. to the purchasing power parity, the buying power of a dollar as compared to the buying power of Indian rupee. So it's like, I was like, I was thinking of having Indian doctors to consult with US patients, but it's like US laws are like, you can't do it because you need license, you need to they get registered here and then you go back to India, then you can do it. But of course, people won't do it, it'll be hard to scale. So I dropped this yeah. idea, but it's a basically a very interesting idea because there was a margin of more than 95 percent it's so amazing basically if that's if the government will allow but the government will never allow because the other thing in the u.s is there are only the u.s and new zealand which allow the former companies to advertise on tv no other no other country almost out in the whole world allow it because the thing is you know these pharma companies give a lot of money to basically you know these politicians in their campaigns in order to be allowed to do that basically you know to, to advertise their things on the on the TV, but in a lot of companies, I mean, most countries, 
I, I just read basically it was just yeah, United States and New Zealand that that allow most countries don't allow like you can't even you know advertise your legal services a lot of services in the u.s which are allowed are not allowed in other countries because u.s is a free market but there are a lot of other free markets does not mean that u.s can allow all these things but i mean you know i really feel bad for the people who are unable to you know basically afford these healthcare services like i was reading 40 to 50 percent of u.s population doesn't have 400 dollars in savings so basically, I mean, you know, yeah. this is, it's it's like, you know, people, the outer world only see the great things of U.S. And the other thing yeah. is, is people compare the income with the people in U.S. from the perspective of just the exchange rate conversion rather than purchasing power parity conversion. It's mm -hmm. like a person that's making 250K in India is same to the person that's making 8 to $16 million in America. That's the difference in terms of the purchasing power. Because the thing is, in India, it's like, one dollar equals to 82 or 83 rupees but yeah. what you can buy from 20 rupees in india you can buy from one dollar in, in basically in america and the thing in us and india is like you know from a business perspective is like let's say if you have a million dollar business in america or let's say you have a eight million dollar business in america okay and you have a let's say five hundred thousand dollar business in india okay so in america it's like when you have eight million business eight million dollar revenue business first of all it's 50 percent margin okay because labor is expensive all the things are expensive and yeah. you know payroll is the biggest expense so then you have 50 percent margin in india most businesses have labor is super cheap in india and most businesses have more than 90 percent margins so then it's in services business i'm telling so it's like 90 percent margins that's one thing now uh, after you know four million is gone you have four million left in profits now in terms of this four million the business has to give you know taxes now on four million it's 50 percent taxes and everything is tracked in us because almost all the people are tracked because of course it's a developed country so then it's like you know two million dollars left for so people have paid the taxes in two million dollars because over four million dollars the profit now two million dollars left in, in india only 60 to 70 million people in in india you know file income tax return out of 1.6 billion people in india okay so it's like there's a tax advantage okay so now this guy who has basically you know five hundred thousand dollars in revenue now he has 450k in profits he has to pay nothing in taxes he has no other expense now the other thing here is like you know now this guy has left with two million dollars now this guy has two million dollars and this two million dollars is like he has to invest 50 percent of it as a working capital to again generate the revenue so now this guy is investing a million dollars to generate revenue. Now the 100% shareholder or the owner of this business can only extract a million dollars out of this business. Now he has a million dollar. Okay. Now in terms of this million dollar, it's almost one fourth the buying power of Indian money. Like mm -hmm. the, what you can buy from one million dollar here is like, you know, it's one fourth. Like I told you, yeah, yeah. 80 rupees is one dollar and 20 a, a, what you can buy from 20 is from what you can buy from two, basically you know one dollar basically 20 rupees what you can buy from one dollar is just like one fourth so now this yeah. one million becomes 250k so in that way you know making eight million dollar business that's making eight million dollars is now getting in the end 250k if, we, if you're post company from the perspective of purchasing power and buying power yeah. as compared to the indian market and this guy has still left 450k mm -hmm. on which he has to pay nothing and the other thing is this guy has 10 percent margins i mean it's basically 90 percent margins so he has very low working capital so he just have to invest another maybe 50k or 25k in order to generate this 500k in revenue so now this guy have 400k which you can use to invest in any other asset class to get returns because you get returns on what you own you make money on what you basically is on basically your own income the time which you give to the world so now see yeah. the comparison and people every indian wants to go to the america every, every indian wants to go to america okay that's the thing but they don't understand that you know there are a lot of it's, it, it's something which is very complex people are like you know basically you know i mean there are a lot of factors a lot of reasons a person can go to the u.s market because a lot of things which you can do in business is in person but I think the best way a person, if someone wants to go in the U.S. market, I think it's a great idea to work in a U.S. company, but still live in India and, you know, basically pay in Indian, Indian currency and, you know, own in U.S. dollars. That's a lot more smarter way rather than going to the U.S. market. Why? It's like well, I could have been in the U.S. market for the past basically, you know, three, four years, but I didn't mm -hmm. went there because first thing is this. I never like to see myself as someone who is a, who is inside a country or who is inside a territory from the perspective of basically you know from the perspective of a citizen like okay i live in india does not mean i'll never leave india 
it's like i see myself as a global citizen that you know every year i don't want to spend the whole year here in india i want to spend you know certain months in different cities different countries of the world different places i want i see myself yeah. for everything i do from a world class perspective so that i can see from different people's perspective because in my business i have met with almost every person in any country in any corner of the world and it's like this gives you a lot more different perspective on how people think people are wired and this yeah. also makes you less biased in a lot of things like you know people are like i don't want to leave this i don't want to do this so okay, people are like they get attached to something you don't want to get a, you don't see when you whenever you get attached to something you give your power to that thing and when you give your power to that thing you don't make good decisions like you you will never make a good decision when you will think i need to make a decision or i need to have this thing like whenever you will think that you know i need to have something that will happen then it's like you know you won't make a good decision if you will think i don't need anything in life and then you are thinking okay what should be the right decision in this situation what my 80 year old version should have said in this situation so that could have been a better decision because if you are thinking about needing then you're getting influence and the thing about asking your 18 year or 80 year old version is like that that person won't have the limitations and insecurities which you have now and that could yeah. be the best advice that you could ever have rather than a person that's trying to get advantage and giving you an advice yeah so how did you start so young at 18 how did you grow so basically I, I didn't start at 18 oh. i started at 12 basically i mean when it comes oh. to you know selling stuff yeah, i yeah. started at 12 because i mean i was crystal clear on my life's purpose and it's like mm-hmm. the thing about a purpose is it's greater than you know basically just making money and the thing about a purpose is you know, a purpose is like, let's say if I'll ask you, Sanjana, what will you do if someone will kidnap your family? You'll be like, you'll do everything to get them back, right? Because you yeah. love your family and that's something in which you believe from your heart. You don't need a manual or a book or someone to tell you or push you to get your family back. You'll just have the drive to figure it out. So same is with life. When you really believe in something from your heart, mm-hmm. you will just have the drive to figure it out. But at the same time, a mentor will help you, a book will help you, the knowledge will help you. But basically, you know, you'll just have the drive. You'll just figure it out. Like if someone, see, it's yeah. about how badly you want something. So I was crystal clear on my life's purpose. I knew what I need to do for my community. And I knew that, what you know, basically, I, yeah, basically, it's life's basically those certain goals which I have, which you can find on my website of found, my foundation website, harshmifoundation.org. That has some goals. You, you can see basically those goals. Those are hundred year goals, so which I have planned for myself and for my generations yeah. as well. So basically the thing about, you know, the, 100 year goals is it's like in order to create a big impact it takes time it really takes time to you know bring or build massive value for the world so Mm -hmm. those are my 100 year goals and you know basically for my goals i know i have to be a billionaire in this life and my kids have to be a billionaire as well in order to basically accomplish those goals to accomplish that financial threshold and the thing so that's basically you know that time i realized i need to make money and at that time mm-hmm. i started making money on my own basically by selling stuff in my school days i was like let's say if i'm in eighth grade so i was selling stuff to people basically you know who were passing from ninth grade into high school so i was using yeah. their old books and i was reselling those books to the students that mm-hmm. were getting into their grade so those people were just setting it selling those things at very minimum rate i was just buying it very cheap and then selling reselling to those students at almost half the original price so basically I was able to, you know, I, I started the different kinds of, you know, basically selling different kinds yeah. of stuff in order to make money in order to, because, but because I was clear from the beginning and my team, I had so many mm-hmm. true believers since that time. I mean, true believer is a person, you know, who believes in your vision, who is not just driven by money because never hire people who are driven by money. The thing about hiring people who are driven by money is like you hire them, you pay them, you train them. Someone offers a better basically price, they leave. Your time is just wasted. Your training wasted. All the things which you spend on that person yeah. is wasted now. So be, focus on hiring people that are vision driven rather than money driven. So what it's was like, the impact you what it, yeah. what was the impact you wanted to make greater than money? You were talking about. Yeah. So basically, so so there are certain goals which I have basically in mind. Especially, you know, when I see the core of all the problems in society, it starts with edu- education. If you will see on mm-hmm. a fundamental level, and, and you know, basically even. Even on a fundamental, it's like education for the teachers that are teaching, okay? Not starting from the students. Because teachers are the people that will be teaching the students. So it's like education with... Yeah. Uh, that's why I'm creating a slavers, basically. Like, I'm creating a whole edu- educational system from scratch. From play school, I'm creating a education slavers. I have a team that's creating a slavers, basically, you know, from scratch to basically, yeah. you know, to basically, you know, 12th grade in India. 
So everything yeah. from Sketch, I'm restructuring everything. I'm adding so many things. It's very amazing. Basically, it's it's in progress. I'll make it in the form of an open website or kind of an open university where people can come and join everything. Will be free or certain types of things I'm planning. Are you but it's add very financial? long. Uh, yeah, I'm add doing it personally. Education? Yeah, yeah, financial education also. There. There's so many things I can tell. There's yeah. no... See, it's like... The, see, one of the things basically, you know, which I considered before writing or basically thinking about basically the structure is, you know, it's like basically I want to create a situation basically, you know, with that syllabus, I want to have a situation where I can have two, three people to create a town that can generate an economic output of $10 million. Mm-hmm. So that was the perspective in my mind that there are three, four group of people and that th- those group of people can basically create an economic output of, you know, basically $10 million with the knowledge which they have. So those people are like one man army type of people that are so skilled in so many different yeah. areas, multi skilled in so many areas that they can basically, you know, they're super sharp, they're super intelligent, they're super wise. So I want to create kind of, you know, kind of a basically, you know, a super smart one man army kind of group that but can do almost everything yeah do you have a way to do that with the people being ethical as well like without corruption yeah see it's like the other thing is this i mean you know there's all these good and bad things in life it's about how good something is and at the same time if the good thing is a lot more stronger then it's a lot more easier to remove the bad thing that's and one of the things like, a lot easier yeah. to do it starting from education like starting for sure a, for, for sure, right? yeah, so, for yeah. sure. Because I, I thought about so many things. You know, what could be something that can make the most fundamental change in life, basically, or make the changes which mm-hmm. I want. And in the end, it was about basically education. Now, of course, yeah. I have so many goals related to education and basically, you know, launching more than hundred million schools in the next ten years, basically globally, basically, you know, for uh, executing that syllabus. And then hundred million, basically, or it was ten million. I guess it was between ten to hundred million. Basically, hospitals as well. With my healthcare system, I'm cha- making some changes in the healthcare system which I have planned. So I'm, I have basically so many things which I'm structuring from upside down. So it's just a very yeah. fundamental change because it's hard. Of course, it takes time and it's yeah. very hard. But it's like it's something which is really meaningful for me. And I'm, I have basically so many a lot of goals in impact investment. Like, see, the thing is, one one great thing is basically about charity or you know basically you know, philanthropists. I really believe basically, you know, in the Rockefeller philosophy in terms of charity that, you know, you know, I mean, you know, uh, charity is injurious for health unless it makes the recipient independent of it. So that's an interesting way to look at charity. Unless it makes the recipient independent of it, it's not good. So one of the other thing is this. See, it's like one thing is called credit credibility. Okay, how credible you are in something before giving me an advice. And then they, I thought about one another thing I observed that there's also a credit ability. Creditability is like, let's say if you are a billionaire, you can have another billionaire to invest with you $100 million, okay? Or if you have a net worth, like Elon Musk, basically, yeah. when he was taking money for basically, you know, like Elon Musk has a net worth of $200, $200 billion, okay? Mm-hmm. And he has got his friends easily to give him billions of dollars to buy a Twitter, okay? So he yeah. has the credit ability because people know he can pay mm-hmm. him back or people know he's smart, he has been successful in his life, okay? So that's his yeah. credit ability, like Jay-Z's, net worth is 2.5 billion dollars but people i mean they are, they are not as much people who know jay-z as the people who know shahrukh khan in india okay like mm-hmm. shahrukh more people know shahrukh khan than more people know jay-z but shahrukh khan net worth shahrukh khan's family net worth is a billion dollars if you combine his and his wife's net worth but it's like if you look at the credit ability of shahrukh khan and jay-z shahrukh mm-hmm. khan has more credit ability if he create a course or if he create something he can monetize over more than four, three or four billion people who know him rather yeah. than Jay-Z who only one billion or two billion people know Jay-Z okay I mean if you will ask in India who knows Jay-Z you will really find people who knows Jay-Z okay I mean it depends on which crowd you yeah. ask but at the same yeah. time most of people in India won't recognize who is Jay-Z but if you will ask a lot of people in America a lot of people know Shah Rukh Khan in America like a lot of people don't know Jay-Z in India but a lot of people know Shah Rukh Khan and basically because Shah Rukh Khan basically and basically, you know, I guess he, he's the second richest actor in the world. And he's like, he is, he mentioned that he never asked for any kind of fees for his acting. So basically, you know, there are a lot of factors. This, this thing about creditability can be used in philanthropy. Like, you know, I can be a billionaire and I can create, you know, many billion dollar funds where I can have other billionaires invest. I can use that money to be invested in my goals in creating the schools and education system I want or different infrastructure projects which I want to do. So I can use their money. Why will I basically, you know, 
give my money my money because if i'll give my money then i'd use then i lose that credit ability i lose that basically ability to use other people's money to allocate it in the way how i want it to create it in the form of an impact investment okay yeah. because i think i mean you know like the way startups are important at the same time more and more venture capital funds are also important because you 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 just like you can grow a business bootstrap but you can't make an apple bootstrap you need money to grow a business you know to make it a very big business and it's like to make those changes you know basically i need to be a billionaire in order to have other billionaires allocate money with me in asset class in venture capital in private equity and hedge funds in different kinds of asset class to invest basically directly to the pub, you know basically basically you know the real world market like having yeah. an education system where people are studying from a world class basically an education system and then trained in a very proper manner i'm also thinking about and another thing about my education system is there's no concept of exam okay so basically it's like having my education system people being trained in it and then basically you know having my health care system as well and let's say people who are interested and you know people's focus from the beginning will be on startups all the people from my school i don't want people who are going in my school to do jobs okay most of the time so it's like you know those people everyone everyone is starting their businesses and then basically you know they are also getting funding to do the changes they want for the rest of the world that are not following my system okay so yeah. they are serving the rest of the world that's not following my system and they are making things cheaper better smarter and they are using the capital which i am using through my friends basically wealth and you know allocating that capital in those investments they are, that are growing then those companies are going public so in that way i structure i'll never use my network to donate because if i donate my money it's like i lose that credit ability and i want to keep that credit ability for long term it's just like let's say there's a person that's running a non profit and a person that's running a for profit now when you run an ngo or non profit you help you can only help so many people with limited amount of money you when you don't have a lot of money right but when you're on a for profit you can he, you can help so many people that's If that's how you donate to the non profit like see it's, no, no 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 so one thing is this see, it's like one thing is a non profit okay where you are investing you are taking donation and you are investing basically that money okay it depends on the level of the foundation and the other thing is this now that person is running a for profit he is making money he is consistently donating for a longer period of time okay yeah now it's not like that this person is donating 100% of his money he is not able to do it for very long that's one of the thing another thing is still if it's going into the non profit as donation it's coming from something that has been done in a for profit manner mm-hmm. so there are two things right and the other thing is this like i tell i i'll say a person that's running a business is more selfless to society than a person that's running an ngo because a person who's running an ngo has is smart enough and skilled enough to run a business to donate to society as compared to a person that's running a business because that person is able to donate consistently if you will took thing from a different perspective of course i highly appreciate the person that's doing running a non profit helping the society that's quick that's so important but i think that person is also skilled enough to run a business to donate more consistently for a longer period of time if you will yeah. think from a, a lot more you know logical perspective because that's something that's which is also possible don't you think i understand what you're saying but then i think that the motivations are different like for sure. it's easy for like a pro- for profit business to get clouded by money and like power and greed and then lose that sense of donating every year whatever you say then it is but, for a non-profit yeah i got your point but at the same time the for profit is the one that's giving to non-profit so if like it's like yeah, if the for, if the for the profit is yeah, no 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 see the thing is if the for profit is not making money and not giving to the non-profit then how will yeah. the non-profit will donate it further otherwise it, the, the see the impact the real impact in the world that's created by non-profit is by the bigger non-profits like the the bill and melinda gates foundation this rockefeller foundation these bigger foundation that has billions of dollars in assets under management these people are making bigger changes of course the people that are that are local non-profits that are they are also doing basically great things that's great but at the same time what i'm saying is the the sources of capital is from for profit so that's what i'm saying yeah and i'm saying that like with a non-profit you know that their motivations are pure but then with a for profit how do you know like what guarantee that do you have that they will continue to donate but at the same time see it's like you know a for profit does not need to donate money to do great things for exactly. society they are giving exactly. employment as well no no what i'm saying what i'm saying is different what i'm saying is a for profit does not need to give money to a non profit to 
to create an impact that's good for society even if they don't do it still they're creating employment they are they're removing poverty when you're removing poverty you are reducing crime so that's another great thing which they're doing even if they're still making money the founders becoming a billionaire keep on making billions and dollars still they're giving employment they're removing poverty from society and they're making things more efficient now when they're also making rich they are becoming rich they're also giving revenue to the government which government has a bigger budget to invest in, in the infrastructure of the country so okay. in that way also it's good i mean even if so, they don't yeah. donate still <laughs> yeah, yeah i see but you're focusing on the positives that the business has but what about like the resources that they're using what about like the natural um resources that they're using they're taking away some as well they're providing sure. jobs they're solving poverty but then they're also using those resources so there's yeah, a definite sure. trade-off for sure, for sure, definitely they did it off. But the other thing is this, let's say if there's no business, let's say it's socialism, okay, government is controlling everything government is doing. Whoa. So government is also using these resources. And at the same time, government is not efficient in providing think... unemployment, you know, basically removing that, you know, basically, you know, providing employment and doing things in a lot more efficient way and increasing their own revenue. Like if, see, it's like if the business is not doing, then the government is doing because those things are needed. Business are not just, you know, throwing things that are not needed. Business are so, throwing things that are needed most of the time. Okay, then it's like if they are not there, then it's like the government is doing at the same time. Resources are being used. Like, of course, you know, the population of the world, basically, I mean, the speed of the, at which the population of the world is growing is unable to keep pace with the resources which the world has. Yeah. That's a philosophy by Malthus. So basically, I got that point. But at the same time, what's being done is like, you know, something what will be done if it would have been done basically if it wouldn't have been done which is going now basically but so i mean in a way yeah even if a f- non-profit was doing all the same things but then the for-profit is concerned about their bottom line you know they're concerned about how much money they spend so they're looking for the cheapest materials possible which means that that causes more of a strain on nat- natural resources if you know what i mean like they're looking for like synthetic materials or something that is the cheapest to produce like okay <laughs> but we're also getting see, it's like, yeah yeah so so, so yeah. i mean you know the thing about the quality is like see the yeah. thing about a bad quality is see one thing is this when you create something of bad quality you are not a big business okay when you create something which is of bad quality you are not a big business because you can't do that for very long Okay, so the thing about creating something bad is like it's not sustainable. And when you are not sustainable, when you are not big, you can't make make a big negative impact in the world. You are creating a small negative impact in the world. So it doesn't matter, first of all. And the other thing is this, if you are able to do it, you can't be very big because you only become big, you know, basically through word of mouth and when you do something great for society. I mean, people... See, it's like people told you about Facebook because people got value from Facebook. Okay, then it becomes big. But it wasn't like that. It was basically, you know, let's say if you're using any kind of kind of product, it has a, you didn't, you didn't heard your friend telling you that Sanjana use this toothbrush or toothpaste because it has the worst taste. Okay, so no one told you this, right? People only told you this, it's the best use it. So people didn't told it's a worst, they didn't use it. Okay, so in that situation, of course, the thing that's growing in a quadratic manner is word of mouth. And word of mouth is only when yeah. people have good experiences. So that's okay. how it is. And the other thing is this, in terms of, you know, a business is like, so, okay, see, see the thing about a business is, it depends basically, you know, what kind of business it is. But at the same time, if you will look at the business, a business fundamental duty is to make you know basically returns for the investors then it is to provide value the only reason for a business to provide value is to make money for long term to make money long term like the reason yeah. companies are worried about their goodwill is not because any other thing it's only about money it's like a lot of companies we have seen they're like we have values we'll only focus on our values the reason they make focus on values is they want to make money in long term not like they really believe in those values Okay, so let's go back to your toothpaste example. Like you yeah. were assuming that they made it from like cheap materials and then it was the worst or something, the toothpaste? No, 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 no. What I was saying is that if something is bad, it doesn't grow. And I'm saying, I'm saying that yeah. just because something is made with bad materials, that doesn't mean that it is bad. Like, for example, the fashion industry here. For sure, for sure, yeah. definitely. For it, sure, they definitely. make it cheaper and then that makes right, it right. good definitely. in the consumer's eyes. Like because at the same time you don't have everyone with everyone not everyone is equal in income, right? And you need to have yeah. products that are low quality to serve the bottom of the market. 
So, and that's the majority about a majority of the people are at the bottom of the market. So you need to have average or bad quality product to be there basically to serve those people. Otherwise, who will serve those people? Well, I think that there are ways like secondhand stores and all that. And um, there's definitely thrift stores that can be beneficial without taking the environment to harm. And then there's also like other fashion companies that are working to be sustainable. But, but at the okay. same time, you know, those companies are unable to scale because the thing is, you know, it's hard. I mean, I mean, the, the ratio is like, I mean, you know, I, I know that's good. That's good for society. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if something, see, it's like there's a very interesting quotation by Nicola Machiavelli is that how we live is very different from how we ought to live. And he who studies what ought to be done rather than what is done will learn the way to his downfall rather than basically to his preservation. So basically, you know, it's inter- it's important to know that, you know, we can't get things to work in the way how we want it. And the thing about money is, that's the th- that's the reason I focused on make- basically, you know, having a financial threshold of being a billionaire because yeah. you can't make any change if you are basically, you know, if you, if you are not credible enough, if you don't have enough financial threshold because you need money to make the changes to have your voice heard. Money is something which can make people to behave in predictable ways and when it's not they behave in unpredictable ways like when there's poverty they scram then they scram there's civil war when there's civil war there's external war that's how things are everything is connected everything is in correlation okay so like on the fashion industry specifically i think that there are ways like um wait what were you saying about them being fashion industry i mean so i was talking about that you know that's not scalable i mean like those businesses oh. are not scalable yeah it's hard to scale to those say, businesses yeah yeah i was going to say that there is interest in becoming ethical now which is why slow fashion companies are becoming more popular because a lot of people are seeing that the materials being used in these like fast fashion businesses are negative and like they're harming the workers as well so people are seeing that but like, I also want to talk about if we got a little off topic, so we can talk about like your ideals and your sure. book. Um, so basically, like one of the thing, basically, you know, about you know the things which you're talking about in terms of recycling is, you know, the, of course that's good for so, that's good for society. But at the same time, it's like you know, it's hard to do something like that on scale because, you know, it's like. These only limited recycled material and then it's and in terms of the fashion companies it's more about branding okay their focus yeah. is also ultimately on making money because they are just using their brand names in order to make a lot of money and you know the other th- other thing is it's a marketing strategy the thing about this marketing strategy is if you have two products option you there's there's a psych it's psychology that if you if a consumer has two product option and if one of the product is giving one person profits to society then people will buy this product. And it's like if, if, if there's something which is if there are two products almost same and you know mm-hmm. if one is helping a social environment then people will opt this one that's how people are so they just yeah. one little thing basically you know, that's why people are like they are using just one one percent of something that's natural and they are saying we are helping nature people yeah, yeah. misrepresent as well a lot of companies do that yeah that's why it's getting the consumers the resources to be able to identify right when a company is saying that they'll do something but they aren't versus like when a company sure. is actually tri- striving for that for sure yeah for sure so okay so back to like something in your book you said one of the quotes was killing may be necessary for peace did you mean yeah, that so, in like the business world no, basically i mean i i meant in a political sense like yeah you know a lot of times war is necessary in a country and in that situation, if less people are being killed, that's better than more people being killed. I mean, of course, it's wrong. Yeah. I mean, killing is yeah. wrong. And killing should only be there, basically, you know, when it's some worst case scenario when nothing else yeah. is possible. So in that situation, I think, you know, less people being killed is better than more people being killed. Mm-hmm. Of course, it's bad. <laughs> yeah. Of course, it's not ethical. Of course, it's wrong. But at the same time, we know world wars have been there in this world you know world war one world war two there are different wars that that happens and it's like you know you can only do so much to prevent these things so at, the, so at that point you become practical and you have to think that what's a practical solution for a problem that's less people being killed rather than more people being killed in a situation in any situation yeah if oh i think you're muted again 
Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. And it's like, is killing necessary at all in the first place? Yeah, for sure. That's the most important thing. No, no, no. I mean, (laughs) it's like it depends. I mean, it depends on the situation. That's what I'm saying. Like, you know, a lot of, I mean, you know, so it's like, there's no coincidence in politics, right? So people have their mm-hmm. own strategic, basically, you know, ideals. Like if there's a country, that country wants to remain dominant and that country is seeing another country rising, that country will find a way to, you know, hurt that country, to destroy that country in order to keep their power consistent, okay? Mm-hmm. In order to make sure that they, are, they, they they don't have a rival that's becoming bigger than them. So that could be a strategy, right? And no but I mean, is, there's you know, ethical ways to do that, like making yourself better in a different way than like hurting the other team. Like there's a way to the improve same yourself time, without. Yeah, but but yet, but yet at the same time, you know, what's harder? I mean, you know, when you do something, you think about what's harder. Is it harder to, you know, grow? <laughs> is it harder to yeah. kill the other country? So people are like, it's easier to destroy that other country than to grow faster. That's the thing. Because the I thing know. is, the thing about a country is, you know, I mean, see, it's like the thing is, the the smaller a community is, the easier for it for that continue that, that community to grow or develop. The smaller that the population of that specific you know community is. Like for let's say there are certain communities that have very less number of people that are very developed in the world because it's yeah. easier to unite less number of people as compared to unite a large number of people and people say that you know people don't have unity people try to pull everyone's legs down so it's like the thing is people are never united that's psychology people are only mm-hmm. united under a strong leader you need more and more leaders in society on a local level on a political level on different level that's how basically you know you create unity yeah well yeah well, this is very insightful definitely um on like a final question, like what were some challenges when starting your like firm and then what are you most proud of in your career? Oh, that's right. This? Yeah, that's an interesting yeah. question. So basically, I mean, in terms of the challenges in growing my business, it's like when I started my business, I was going from Asia to Middle East, then European market, then basically in the US market, Latin American market, then I went into the US market. So I went to yeah. all the markets, then I went into the US market. So it's like yeah. basically, you know, when you grow a business, you know, when you when you start a business, so the problem which I face, which I think a lot of people face when they start a business, especially in the US market is, when you start a business, you don't have, a, you don't have, I mean, you know, your first customer is like, you know, is the hardest to get. So that was yeah. the thing basically which I faced my first customer but it's like mm-hmm. I should say my second customer my second customer was the hardest to basically you know basically get my first customer was the one because of which I make adjustments in my business model according to to fit his needs that's uh, how I basically structured yeah, so my was... business model and then it was mm-hmm. my basically second customer because the thing is I started my business I had my first customer he was not satisfied so that's why I didn't have a good reference to present to his second customer that's oh. why it was hard so <laughs> that was the situation and it's like the other thing was in terms of the thing which I'm most proud of, I'm I'm saying it's like I'm very proud of what I have become, like in all dimensions of my life, mentally, socially, spiritually, physically, or financially, in all dimensions what I have become. I have basically I'm happy that I have achieved all the layers in Maslow's hierarchy of needs where you have all physiological needs, all basically you know your social belonging yeah. needs, your you know self actualization, self esteem, yeah. everything like you have got wealth, health, happiness, relationships, and basically you know fame or anything else basically which I needed. I've got everything. I'm very happy about it, and it's just about going to the next level. And I need, don't I don't need to worry about anything. I have ultimate freedom in my life. I don't know. I can do whatever I want, mm-hmm. and I can even retire now. I'm in my very early twenties, and I can retire now. So it's like. I'm very happy about what I have become like for me. My biggest strength is my thought in my mind that, you know, by change, by changing myself, I can get anything in this world. That's my biggest strength because if someone will attack on me when I'm not armed, then people can basically, you know, attack on me. People can break my legs or my basically hand or basically I can go in coma. But it's like, you know, if I am, if I still have that thought, if I believe in that thought, that you know by yeah. change i can do anything in this world i can still do great things if i'm on bed if i'm lying on bed if if i'm if i've got a major accident if a lot of organs in my body are tears or whatever the worst case scenario is yeah. so still i have this thought that's my biggest strength for me like by change i can do anything in this world and i have, I have one of the great thing one of my great strength is i have like you know when i have a goal 
I see it as a reality. It's like when I set a goal, I have so superhuman confidence in my abilities and I, that I'm like, it's just future reality. I haven't mm. done this thing, but it's but it's like, it's it will happen. It's not like that, oh, if it doesn't happen, it's like, it will happen. I have so yeah. confidence in my abilities and it's like, I'm very happy that, you know, God has given me everything that I asked for and everything I needed in life. And that's why in, in terms of my prayers, I don't pray for anything for which I'm not putting any effort. I feel bad when I ask for something, even from God that, you know, I'm, I'm asking for something and I'm not working the, for that thing. It's like, mm. I don't feel that as very effective. So I focus on putting efforts, then I pray for God. Of course, basically, you know, it's a good thing to pray from God, great things, basically, you know, yeah. but it's like, I, 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 it's like, you know, when you are naturally a giver, when you are a giver in your life, it becomes hard even sometimes for you to ask things from other people because your focus has to be always on giving rather than receiving. And, you know, when you keep on giving something for a while, then, you know, automatically, you know, God gives you back or the world gives you back those things. And, you know, yeah. it's like you get positive energy by giving positive energy You whatever you give, you'll receive. Actually, I have just a curiosity question. Like throughout this interview, you've been like quoting a couple of people like philosophers and all that. Is there any like, do you read books that um, give yeah. you these quotations? Or what yeah, I mean, the so, so the thing is, you know, I, I, I have been reading books when I was 14 years old. So I've read a lot of books and I've read the best books in the world. I've learned from the best people in the world. It's like to be the best, you have to learn from the best. And I'm not yeah. saying best like, you know, Alan Musk. For me, Alan Musk is not the best. I'm talking about the people who started from the beginning, like, you know, the from the history. The starting from the kings, different kings, Solomon and also Rockefeller, John e. Carnegie, Rothschild family this family, Vanderbilt family, and basically different you know, rulers in the past, you know, different people who are more historical figures rather than people who are currently, because it's like the thing is, Elon Musk is the richest person of the world at this point of time, known. By the way, he's not, he's not among top 10. I don't think he's among top 10 because the people, realist people in the world are not even on the list. Like you have Vladimir Putin, he's a trillionaire. You have different other people, you know, who people hate. They are, they haven't, you know, shown their wealth. They are a lot more richer than these people on the list. And these people are not even the full, it's not even the half, basically, of the total real number of billionaires in the world because it's just the people who are, in, basically, you know, who are recorded. And most people yeah. who are billionaire uh, want to hide their wealth. So it's like, you know, in terms of, uh, basically, you know, what was the question, by the way? Forgot, like w what books would you recommend yeah, yeah so basically in terms of the books basically it's like you know i started reading from the age of 14 so i think you know to at the early stages of your life you should ask for others to basically to, for, to learn things you should read more books and you know learn from more mentors in the early stages of your book and at later stage of your life you should focus on self-learning think on yourself because if someone needs to learn always from the other person then that person is stupid because that person is just getting knowledge not getting wise because when you get wise, yeah. you self-observe, you learn things on your own rather than learning everything all the time. So I, less, I read less, I just read summaries basically, weekly summaries, one summary per week. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. It was really nice talking to you. Perfect. Thanks for having yeah. me, Sunshine. Have a great time. Bye-bye. Yeah, you too.